uh, we're in Matthew chapter 26 this morning, and we're going to do a little bit, you know, Easter's kind of late this year, and we've got a few weeks up until Easter, so just kind of wanted to take a look at some different happenings, some different events that happened up into the crucifixion of Jesus. There's so many things that we can look at through this. I won't be able to touch on them all um, throughout the next few weeks, but we'll take a look at some of the some of the events that happened right before the crucifixion. Uh, I believe that there's um, a lot we can get out of these, of taking a look at some of these things. Uh, today, of course, we're going to talk about Judas, one of the disciples who agreed to betray Jesus. And, you know, um, let's, we know, and we're going to touch on this in the sermon, but uh, Jesus, uh, Jesus, Judas uh, agreed to betray Jesus, but it wasn't the act of Judas that got Jesus on the cross. Jesus went on the cross willingly, okay? Uh, but Judas uh, agreed to be betray him, and when you think about betray or betrayal, you know, stabbing someone in the back kind of thing, you know, um, that I, I heard a, a, a statement once. I'm going to try to get this right. Um, it's, it said, uh, your true friends will make fun of you to your face, but talk good about you behind your back. That's your true friends. They're going to make like we pick on each other in church. Yeah, we, we have a good time, we pick on each other, but if out in the community, if someone says something bad about one of us, get, oh, uh, uh right? You know, we take up for each other behind each other's back. The, unfortunately, sometimes people are the opposite, right? They'll talk good about you to your face, and they'll talk bad about you behind your back, but true friends do that the opposite. They, they'll talk bad about you face to face, they'll pick on you and point out your faults, but out in the public, they'll defend you. Yes, ma'am? It's bad when they tell the truth. <laughs> yeah, yeah, go ahead. Stick together. Mm -hmm. That's right. Stick together. And, and Jesus had this hand-picked group of disciples, you know, and he knew Judas. He knew everything about Judas. He knew who, what was in Judas' heart, but this was just to fulfill the fulfillment of Scripture, you know. And so Judas was part of this. But Judas had, his, had some issues. Well, they all did, but Judas' issues were a little bit more deep-rooted than, than the rest, I suppose. So we're in Matthew chapter 26, we're starting with verse 14. Then one of the twelve, called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priest and said, What are you willing to give me if I deliver him, capital H, so Jesus, I deliver him to you? And they counted out to him thirty pieces of silver. So from that time he sought opportunity to betray him, to betray Jesus. Thirty pieces of silver. Now, you know, 30 pieces of silver in that time was a decent amount of money, okay? Uh, was it worth the price that Judas had to pay for doing this? No, it was not. And we read this, and we, uh, we see what the, the price was. You know, you've heard that statement, you know, everyone has a price, right? Offer them enough, and they'll, you know, they'll, they'll give in to whatever the... the whatever is being presented to them, if you offer them enough. Well, I mean, we need to make sure that our standards, what we believe in and, and, and who we are in Christ has, has no price because the <coughs> debt we owe, the debt we owe, we can't pay. Jesus paid that for us. So we need to always remember that. And we read this scripture and we think about Judas and how he betrayed Jesus. And we think about, wow, how could he do that? How could he do this? How could for 30 pieces of silver for you know a decent amount of money, but we think in ourselves there's no amount of money that, that someone could pay us for us to betray Jesus. We, we we say that and we think that. But at the same time, and I'm just gonna step on my own toes too, at the same time, I think we probably betray Jesus more than we know in our own lives as Christians. <laughs> Because really, Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments, right? If you love me, you'll, you'll, you'll keep my commandments. And, um, you know, if, and also, the Bible tells us that um, putting something else before God is, is idolatry, sin, 
putting some, anything else above God, that's a sin. And the Bible also tells us that for those that know to do good and do it not, that's a sin. So, I think when we get right down to the, to the bottom line, unfortunately today, and again, I can speak of me, that I probably, without even really thinking about what I'm doing, I betray Jesus for a lot less than 30 pieces of silver. You know, and I, you know, sometimes I don't, I, I never want to, I don't mean to, but when it comes right down to it, I, I'm, unfortunately, I think I do sometimes. Um, you know, we, 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 uh, we, we think about our, our, uh, our, our daily lives and, and our walk with, with Jesus, and, and I, you know, I've referenced this so many times, but it's, it's just the truth. When, when Jesus, or when God created Everything back in Genesis, he put the Garden of Eden there. It was perfect. He had Adam and Eve in it. Everything was good, and he walked with them daily. That's God's desire to walk with us daily. And you know, there's times when my life gets hectic and busy that my relationship with my heavenly Father is no more than a token prayer of a morning and an evening, and little other thought going on in between that time. And my prayers mean about as much as me chanting um, a, a, you know, like a, yeah, yeah, exactly, and it, you know, just something, a lot of times I have to guard myself because, you know, Gail and I will pray together at night, <laughs> and I'll have to catch myself because I will be saying the same, Lord, thank you for this day, watch no one's being with us, blah, 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 and before I know it, I'm almost done with my prayer, and I realize I haven't said anything differently than I said for the last three weeks, it's just a repetition, you know? So, what if every morning I got up and said, good morning, dear, have a great day, and walked out of the house. Then every evening I came in and said, hello, dear, hope you had a wonderful day, and went to bed. How long do you think that would fly? <laughs> How long do you think that would go on before Gail said, hey, <coughs> maybe two, maybe one, I don't know. I haven't tried it because I want to live. Okay, so, <laughs> I haven't tried that, but think about that now. Think about that, the relationships we have with the people that we love. And if we just said a token, good morning, and a token, good night, and that was it, how close is that relationship? You see, men, you know this, our, our, the, the ladies in our lives, okay, they want to communicate, and they want to talk. And we don't, usually. <laughs> right? But they're like, you know, what are you feeling? Talk about this. And we're like, kind of hungry. <laughs> you know? We're, we're not good at this stuff. Okay? But it's, it's good that we have that, you know, that ebb and flow there within a relationship because to, to truly have a relationship with someone, you need to have that communication. You need to be able to tell your significant other how you feel, okay? And they need to be able to take that, interpret it, and be able to then respond in the way that, that the other person feels, and then sometimes you have to make compromises, and the situation that I was talking about beforehand, there have been three years of a lot of back and forth communication. And there was a lot of the time that I would just, nah, it's, it'll be fine, don't worry about it. Instead of really digging in and seeing what she was saying. And really looking at our kids. And really evaluating what is truly important out of life. That's what she's been saying the whole time. And I'm a very slow learner. It took me three years to figure that out. Okay? But sometimes you've got to really dig in and, and communicate. Sometimes you have to, it, to be in a, in a close relationship with someone, sometimes you have, to, you have to actually, dare I say the word, change something about yourself. Sometimes. No. <laughs> it's true, though. You know? To, to make this thing work, sometimes you have to kind of change your, your focus. Change what you want out of life. And sometimes you have to make compromises and make changes to make things work sometimes. Not every time, but a lot of times. That's kind of like the relationship with our Heavenly Father. Only, and I, it's funny, I wasn't even going to use this, but Neil, we, we were talking this morning in our breakfast club and Every time I, every, I've 
I've not won many arguments with my wife. I haven't won many. I have won a few. I've won a few. I mean, I could count them on one hand, but I've won a few. Okay? <laughs> and so one time, I remember where I was telling Neil about this this morning. It was June or July. It was hot. Okay? Hot day, hot summer day. And we, we are in Gail's minivan driving to Parkersburg. And whatever the argument, disagreement was, I won. And it, it, it was like, woo, black and white, winner, loser. Yes, <laughs> I won. And so we're driving along, and I'm feeling good. You know, I'm like, one more of these. <laughs> yes. You know, I got it. Man, and if we, whatever it was, it was, I was right. And it, and, okay, woo, yes. We're driving along, and next thing you know, I mean, I start sweating. Hot. I start sticking to the seat, sweat pouring down my forehead. I'm turning the air conditioner. I was like, is the air conditioner working? He goes, like, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm fine. In fact, I'm a little chilly. I said, well, I'm not. Maybe I'm coming. I don't know. I'm coming down with something. I don't know. She had turned the seat heater on. <laughs> she had turned the heater on the seat on and up as high as it would go. So <laughs> and I, as I'm driving to town, <laughs> so even when I win, I'm loose. Okay? So, <laughs> so men in the room, uh, Arguing with your wife, obviously, is a no-win situation, but everyone in the room, there's no reason ever to argue with our Heavenly Father, because He's right, period, and He wants what's best for you and I, and so we really don't need to have an, a conversation with Him arguing about something, because He's right, okay? He's right. So, whenever we find ourselves in these situations where we talk about some of these hard things like... What's your 30 pieces of silver? In other words, what is it that you will be, betray Christ? What you put in, before Christ? You know, that's not the time to argue. Well, no, nah, it's not that way. Well, it kind of is. Actually, let's just put it the way that, yes, it is that way. We need to put him first in everything we do. Easier said than done, but we need to put him first. Every decision that we make in our lives, you know, maybe I shouldn't say every decision because when you get married, you don't make many decisions, right? Because <laughs> you're told what to do. I'm, I'm kidding. I'm joking. <laughs> but like I woke up this morning and I decided what shirt and tie I was going to wear. That might be the last decision I make all day because the rest of the day is kind of planned out. Okay? <laughs> but... So what shirt and tie I put on really doesn't have, it, have any relevance on anything. So there's not every decision that may, may be life-changing. But we make a lot of decisions every day. Believe it, we do. We make, should I go talk to this person? Should I, you know, watch, am I going to read my Bible a little bit? Or am I just going to just sit here and, you know, watch TV or something? You know, those little decisions that we need to make, let every one of those decisions be led and directed by our Heavenly Father. That we, we need to be in a, in a contact, in a relationship with him, that whenever we step out of line, or I should say when we step out of line, because we will, we will, we step out and there's this little tug, or maybe a little feeling in the pit of our stomach that's, hey, ding, 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 get you know, back on track, back on track, because, you know, that happens to me constantly, okay, constantly. I'll be going out here, oh, 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 veered off, oh, veered off, got to come back. I'm, I'm glad. I think the Lord knew me. The Lord knew what well, he made me, of course, so he knew everything about me. So that's probably why he put me in Alfred Hickman's house growing up, because he knew I was going to need it. Okay? And so, <laughs> and so uh, you know, that, because to stay in that close personal relationship with him, we have to keep, we have to keep in a, in a, in a constant communication, right? Now, a lot of times that means that we have to take the time to listen, okay? Because a lot of times I'll pray, but then I'm out. You know, thank you for the day, blah, 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 you know, hallelujah, let's go Mountaineers, and I'm gone. Sometimes there is a time that we need to pray and then just kind of just sit and wait and let that, let there be stuff that comes up within our spirit, you know, that, that, that doesn't come from, I've had some great ideas, and I know they're not coming from my own head. You know what I'm saying? I'll just sit and wait, and then something pops up. This happened with the, the baptism class, right? Nita made this. 
And I prayed about it. I said, Lord, I don't know what to do. What am I, what am I supposed to do with that? I just, then I just kind of waited. And then, well, duh. And then, phew, there it was. You know, that didn't come from me. You know, y'all know that. Okay? That was like the, the, the Lord kind of just worked through me. Okay? With that. Just, that's just one example. There's, there's been many. So we have to take the time in, a, in this relationship with this close walk with him to take the time to listen to what he has to say. Now, probably you're not going to hear a, a voice that comes out and says, Jason, I want you to. That's not what I'm talking about. But they'll be just, it'll come up in your spirit. You'll just feel it. You'll know. You know, oh, wow, that's from God. You know, you just kind of know when, it, when that happens. All right. Um, I shared this with you a long time ago. Um, I'll share this with you now before I move on. I don't even know if this has anything to do. With, well, it does, but the only time I ever, and I don't know if it was an audible voice, meaning if it was out loud or if it was just me, but one time when I was a, I was a probably junior, senior in high school, and I was struggling with making the right choices as a junior and senior in high school and had made some mistakes, was praying to God, feeling terrible, feeling about that tall, right? Feeling about that tall, just tore up hurt, right? I was even, I, I was actually had some tears going. I was, I messed up and I was feeling terrible. And I heard, wasn't thinking about it, wasn't, didn't have this thought in my head, was feeling like the lowest of the low, and I heard a voice that said, I love you. Stop me in my tracks. I'll never forget that. You know, feeling as low as you can feel, and the Heavenly Father saying it. I love you. Because he does. He loves us, period. He loves us. See, I'm joking about our marital relationships, but a lot of times we love them, but we love them as long as they do A, B, and C. <laughs> right? Just being honest, right? You know, we'll love them no matter what, but it's a lot easier to love them when they do A, B, and C. Okay? Well, God loves you. Period. Period. He loves you on your best day. He loves you on your worst day. He loves you. Now, if we have sin in our lives, he has to turn his back on that because he's, he's pure and he's holy. He won't look on that. Even Jesus on the cross, God turned his back on his own son because he took the sins of the world on him. But that doesn't change how he feels about you. And as soon as you hit your knee and you repent of those sins, boom, I love you. There he is. You know? That's, that's, a, that's amazing to think about. So Judas... Moving on here, Judas talks to the to the chief priest and says, "Hey, uh, how much money you give me if I get this guy for you?" And it's kind of funny because it's not like Jesus had this entourage, this loaded military, keeping him, protecting him. He's just out there walking around. It's not like they needed anybody. They, if they wanted him, they just go get him. But Judas is like trying to get some money out of this. So how much money you pay? Huh? You know, hey, let's make a deal here, right? Thirty pieces of silver. All right. So he looked. To betray him. Then, if you'll jump over in the same chapter, chapter 26 to verse 47, it says this Jesus had just prayed in the garden. We'll have a sermon on this in a week or two about the, the prayer of Gethsemane in the garden. So, we're going to kind of skip all that, but this is just right after that prayer. And while he was still speaking, behold, Judas, one of the twelve, with a great multitude, with swords and clubs, came from the chief priests and elders of the people. Again, they've got this whole mob mentality. <laughs> the mob mentality, right? You know, people kind of, you know, it, it's happened. People got their pitchforks and they're, you're right, and they're, ah, it's getting. Again, Jesus didn't have a, he was just out there hanging out in a garden, had just finished praying. His army was 11 guys that had zero weapons. You know? I mean, think about it. Here they come with these clubs and these sticks and, you know, everything else, probably like the group of people that was, I don't know, that, you know, coaches can relate to that. <laughs> you have a bad year, here comes the mob. <laughs> you know, Huggins probably had to hide for a while, but mob's probably after him. The guy's won 800 games, he's going into the Basketball Hall of Fame, and he had a bad year, and everyone thinks he, he's an idiot now. You know what I mean? He's just, wait a minute, that's coach. But they, they're after him, okay? They've got all these clubs, and, and they're, they're, coming, they're coming for him. Now his betrayer had given them a sign, saying, this is, of course, talking about Judas, whomever I kiss, he is the one, sees him. Immediately he went up to Jesus and said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. 
Now you talk about betrayal. Betraying with a kiss on the cheek. I mean, that was a common greeting back in the day, you know. Uh, thankfully, that's changed <laughs> in America. You know, that's, you know, a handshake will do, right? <laughs> but this was a common greeting in the, at the time. And so he comes up and he kisses Jesus' cheek, and that's the signal, boom, 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 that's the guy. Did they not know who he was before this? I mean, you know, I, I, I don't understand. You, you know what I mean? Like, I don't, these people, Jesus was in the temple and in the city, and people knew who he was. It's not like they had to figure out which one of them is it. But, you know, Judas went and kissed him on the cheek. That You talk about stabbed in the back. You talk about your friends saying one thing to your face and saying something else to everyone else. Boy, this is it right here. And if you <coughs> are ever in a situation where someone has done you wrong, has stabbed your back, has said something nice to you and went out somewhere else and has run your name through the mud, pray about it because Jesus knows exactly how you feel. He lived it. Okay? He prophecy. lived it. No. Prophecy was fulfilled. Absolutely. It was prophesied in the Old Testament. All of this stuff was prophesied. And actually, the, the scripture is going to show us that in a little bit. That all this stuff is a fulfillment of, of prophecies, of scripture. There are so many prophecies in the Old Testament. Hundreds and hundreds of prophecies that if you looked at them and if you took them all up and you compiled them in a list, you would say that there is no way. It is not possible for anyone else besides Jesus to ever fulfill every one of them. And he did. Every one of them. Every eye was dotted. Every T was crossed. He fulfilled every one of those prophecies. And it was it could only be done by one person. Jesus himself. Okay? <clears throat> but Jesus said to him, Friend, why have you come? He knows why. <laughs> you know? Jesus knows why he's there. I mean, he knows what's in Judas' heart. So he's just, friend, why have you come? You know, just, he knows what's going on. But again, Jesus also knows this. This is a fulfillment of Scripture. Jesus knows why he's here. He knows what has been written in the Old Testament. He helped write it, right? So he knows what's there. So he knows all this stuff is happening for a reason. Why have you come? Then they came and laid hands on Jesus and took him. And suddenly one of those who were with Jesus... I believe that most Bible scholars believe this is Peter, right? The, the most outgoing one, okay? One of them who were with Jesus, um, sorry, some of those who were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. So they're trying to come and, and get Jesus, right? And Peter's like, uh-uh, pulls out a sword, wham, takes the guy's ear off. Imagine that. This is a Bible story, guys. You know? <laughs> Here's an ear. Lay it on the ground. The guy's like, ah! What's wrong? What? <laughs> All right. <laughs> then they came. <clears throat> Sorry. <laughs> All right. So, but Jesus said to him, put your sword in its place. For all who take the sword will perish by the sword. In other words, there's 12 of them, and if they draw their swords out and they try to fight this mob, it's not going to end well for any of them. Jesus understands that. And he also knows it's a fulfillment of Scripture, and this is just the way it's got to be. So he says, put your sword away. Or do you think, now check out verse 53, the power of God. Or do you think that I cannot now pray to my Father, and he will provide me with more than 12 legions of angels? How then could the scripture be fulfilled that it must, must happen thus? Jesus said, put your sword away. Don't you realize I could have all of heaven fight this right now and get me out of this if I chose to, and these people wouldn't stand a chance? He said, but, but if I do that, how's the scripture going to get fulfilled? Heavy. <laughs> Heavy stuff. Okay? All right? In that hour, Jesus, by the way, in other accounts of this story, Jesus actually heals the guy's ear. So he picks the ear up off the ground and says, here, buddy, Whoop. heals him, and guess what? They're still after him. Now, how would you feel? <laughs> I mean, how crazy is that? My ear is laying on the ground, blood coming down the side of my head. This guy picks it up, puts it back on my face, and I'm healed. Thanks, man. Now let's go. <laughs> Goodness. These people... <laughs> Two ears on one side, yeah. Oh my. <laughs> In that hour, Jesus.
Jesus said to the multitudes, Have you come out as, a, as against a robber with swords and clubs to take me? I sat daily with you teaching in the temple, and you did not seize me. But all this was done that the scripture of the prophets might be fulfilled. Okay, just as, as Bob mentioned earlier. Then all the disciples forsook him and fled. Wow. I mean, they just saw, they heard all of what Jesus had taught. They saw him do all these miracles and all these wonderful things. But as soon as times got tough, right, and the clubs came out, they all said, see ya. And I backed away. How could he have fallen? Yeah. So if you've ever felt alone, if you've ever felt betrayed and alone, pray about it. Because Jesus knows exactly how you feel. You see, we're not praying to some piece of stone or a rock, okay? We're praying to our Heavenly Father through His Son who lived life here and knows exactly how you feel. Because He felt it too. He was tempted, the Bible says, tempted and tried in every way that we are, yet without sin. If you've ever been tempted or tried, Jesus has been through the same thing you are feeling at that moment. The, he's felt. Because we have cars now instead of camels. We have the internet instead of writing on a rock or something. But the, the trials and, and the temptations are the same and, and have been since the dawn of time and will be to the end. None of that changes. We think we've advanced so far as a, as a human race, but it's really the same problems that we've always had. Just, you know, a different way to deal with them, I guess. We Google it now, right? Instead of going to the witch doctor, we Google it. <laughs> you don't Google symptoms on the internet. Oh my goodness. But anyway, all right. So we see that they came and they seized Jesus. And Jesus said, you're, white. you're coming after me like I'm some kind of thief. You know? And he already said, if I didn't want you to take me, you wouldn't. I mean, he knows that. But he's, trying, he's getting his scripture fulfilled. Now, here's the danger of those 30 pieces of silver or whatever it is in our own lives that we put before God. That, and, and like I said before, it's just the truth. If you're putting something before God, then you, I, if I'm putting something before God, then I'm betraying Jesus with that. That's just the truth. I'm betraying Jesus. If I put something before him, then I'm betraying him with that. It may not be 30 pieces of silver. It could be anything. But if it's got to go God first. That's what it's got to be. And if you put him first, if you put him above everything else, then those other things that you like and are, and, and, and are, and are, are drawn to or driven by, see, for me, like, it's always football. Y'all know that. It's not a, everyone knows that I, I can put football first. And I have some. A lot. Okay? Be honest. I put football first a lot in my life. That has what has caused me to make a lot of the decisions that I have made. I've lived in three different states. I've coached at a number of different schools. And I didn't ask God where I should go. I just did. For a long time. That's what's different about now. Because I'm not making the decision now that's best, that's best for my career. Because we got some work to do. <laughs> okay? And, and, we're, and, and at, at Rome, there is a, a group of kids that I've worked with and poured myself into that's getting ready to be seniors. I'm about ready to eat people. And I know they're going to be good. I know that. But that's not what's best for my family. And that's not where God wants me. So it's God first. Okay? Then it's family. And then for me, it's football. For you, I don't know what it is. But, you know, it's something. Okay? So... What I have found out is that if I put God first, then the other stuff works out. Works out. God takes care of that stuff. Okay? For if I try to take care of it myself, it's like trying to beat a round peg into a square hole all the time, just trying to get something to work on my own. But as soon as I say, here God, you take this, I'll do whatever you want me to do? Bloop. There it goes. You know, I'm living it right now, right? 
I mean, it's just it, two days, boom. Two days. Wow. That's God, you know. It's, 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 a, it's a consequence of me saying, God, you're first. I don't care what, you're first. I won't coach football. You're first. Whatever it is you want me to do, you, you lead. You take it. You. Not me. You. It took me a long time to get to that point. And then, boom, God takes care of the rest. That's what we have to do. We have to make sure that we're not putting something above God because whatever it is that we put before him, well, let's talk about what happened to Judas first, then we'll talk. We're in, now we're in Matthew chapter 27. We're starting with verse 3. Then Judas, his betrayer, seeing that he, Jesus, capital H again, his betrayer, seeing that he, Jesus, had been condemned, was remorseful and brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. So it took Judas, the genius that Judas is, to see Jesus being condemned to death to realize, oh, man, I messed up. I don't think Judas might have... Judas betrayed Jesus for this money, but I don't think he felt like it was going to go as far as for Jesus to be crucified. I think he probably felt like he was going to betray Jesus, get some money in his pocket, Jesus was going to do what Jesus does and get out of it, and then he was going to be a lot richer and still be hanging out with the disciples and Jesus down the road. That's kind of, I think that's what his thought process was. I'm going to betray Jesus, get some money, and then Jesus is going to do what Jesus does because they've been after him for a while. There were times when the, mob, the crowd was closing in and Jesus just kind of, just kind of went off through the crowd. They were like, where'd he go? You know, so I think Judas felt like, eh, we're going to get him this time. They're going to bring him to trial, but he probably won't, you know, lead to a crucifixion on the cross. I don't think he was expecting that. And then when he saw that it was going to happen, he became sorry for what he'd done. Okay? And he brought back the money. Anything that we're putting before our Heavenly Father is worthless. Those 30 pieces of silver became worthless to Judas when he realized what he, what he had done. Whatever it is that we're putting before God is worthless because at the end of the day, when, when this life is over, it's all about the treasures that we're laying up in heaven. That's it. Everything else, good old Brady Richards. Not going to have a U-Haul attached to your hearse when you die. You know? It's not. So we spend all this time trying to get all this stuff and do all this stuff, but at the end of the day, honestly... That's worthless. It truly is. And that's what I have to keep in my mind. That I know that God has called me to be a, a football coach for the relationship with those men, for those young men. I know that. It's not about wins and losses. It's about helping those kids see who they are and see what they can become in life. You know? That's what it's about. That's what it's about. So I have to keep reminding myself of that. But whatever it is that we're putting before God, it's worthless. That 30 pieces of silver became absolutely worthless, worthless to Judas. He brought it back. I don't want this. See? <clears throat> and they said to Judas, what is that to us? You see to it. In other words, like, whatever, we got him. We don't care what you do. You know? Then he threw down the pieces of silver in the temple. This was in the church. The people who had Jesus crucified on the cross was church people. The people who caused Jesus, the, his, all his problems in his ministry was church people. The religious people of the day. You've got to be careful being church people. That we're not so caught up in our own man-made traditions that we totally miss the boat when Jesus comes by. Okay? We've got, we got to make sure now that we're just not all caught up in everything that we're, that we're all about. You know, we do this, this, and this. Well, sometimes Jesus wants to do something else. We've got to be open and willing to do that. Okay? <clears throat> so he threw, that, he threw down the pieces of silver in the temple, and he went out and hung himself. See, whenever we put things before Christ, it's always going to lead to problems. It's always going to lead to trouble. It led to a physical death for Judas, but it will lead to a spiritual death for us, for our care. Putting something before Christ can lead us to a spiritual death. We've got to be careful about that. got to be careful because whatever it is we're putting before God, again, is worthless. 
That money is on the temple floor now. Judas doesn't care about it, doesn't want it. The truth of the matter is, whatever we're putting before God is, is just that worthless. So we've got to make sure that we're, we're, we're uh, putting our focus and attention on the right things. But the chief priest took the silver pieces and said, it's not lawful for, to, to put them into the treasury because they are the price of blood. They're like, nah, we probably shouldn't put this in the church account because, you know, so, <laughs> this money really wasn't. <laughs> Jeez. Imagine, you know, it's about like, you know, some church.